as recently as 150 years ago, practically every house in America was off the grid. This is how you got your water. Mm. This was your sewer. And where's your lighting and heating coming from? You're looking at it. Modern houses like these are connected to a variety of systems. There are pipes that carry gas and water into the house. And there's also a pipe that carries waste out of the house to the sewer line here in the street. And these houses are wired to the local electric company, to the cable provider, and to the phone company. Can new technology allow us to live off the grid in an efficient way and still have all the comforts of a modern home? Well, I'm headed to South Carolina to find out. Good morning, Ross. Good morning, Ralph. Welcome to our home in Pickens, South Carolina. What a beautiful place, what a beautiful house. Thank you. When I think of off-the-grid houses, though, I'm not thinking of this. I mean, this is grand, this is luxurious. How many square feet? There's 6,800 square feet. Wow. This house was built 15 years ago. This house has always been off the grid as far as water and sewer, but now my wife and I have decided to take it completely off the grid. Now, I've been in the air conditioning business for 50 years. There's technologies available commercially that will allow us to do that. Gotcha. So you're taking commercial technologies, applying it to a residential house. This is not off the grid yet. You guys are transitioning? We're transitioning. We're about halfway through right now. Got it. Well, I'd love to see the technology. Can we check it out? I would love for you to see it. All right, let's go. <laughs> so how is Ralph moving this 6,800 square foot house completely off the grid? For starters, he's getting his electricity from renewable sources. When it's completed, this solar array will have 144 photovoltaic panels and provide 40 kilowatts of power. A wind turbine will generate electricity at night or on cloudy days. A battery bank will store unused power for lighting and appliances. But the solar array also powers these chillers, which as a system are more efficient to run than a conventional air conditioning unit. But think of the insanity of how that equipment operates, okay? It takes heat from your house and then exhausts it outside, okay? And, and, and it's wasted. What we were able to do is to capture that heat. We, we uh, pull the heat from the house and we put it into a tank for hot water, make it available for the household hot water, for the swimming pool, for whatever you'd like to have. And also in the winter, we're able to pull heat out of the air, even as low as 20 below zero, and move it into the structure or into a storage tank. And then the magic of this, I assume, is that you're not making heat, you're moving heat? We're moving heat. And where do you store that heat? Well, we have some tanks I'd like to show you. All right, love that. Ross, this is where the hot and cold glycol come up, okay? Uh, these tanks are actually buried about four feet in the ground, and I've got one open over here for you to take a look at. Okay. okay. What's inside these tanks okay. is, is hundreds of feet of polytubing or PEX, okay? Mm -hmm. This tank is normally filled with water and we use it to store heat. We'll bring the excess heat or any heat that's produced with the PV through the chiller, mm -hmm. we'll bring it in here and we'll store a tank of hot water. So essentially what we have here is a thermal battery. Rather than a battery that stores electrons, we have a battery that's storing BTUs. And what, what are you gonna use that hot water for? Uh, for, ha for comfort heating. Okay, for our household hot water or swimming, tea, whatever, anything you want to use the hot water for. Got it, got it. Okay. But you're also doing this with the cold tank, right? That's correct. What we do with the cold tank is the cold glycol comes in, goes through the tubes, and we'll make a 500 pound block ice. Really? Inside, that's right. We'll use that tank at night for, to keep the house cool. So even when the sun's not shining, you're not running your equipment, you're a chiller. It's completely and off. And you have a block of ice to pull all that cooling energy from. Absolutely. Wow, that's fascinating stuff. Well, Ralph, I love to hear the fact that you're going off grid. One of the things that's surprising to me is that the technology you're using here today is actually old technology. It's been used for 30 years in commercial buildings. So why has it been a slow adoption for residential use? Well, commercial and residential has always been built differently, okay? Commercial rates are uh, rates that have peak and time of use components, okay? okay? There are times of day where businesses or commercial applications pay more for their power than they do at others. And it could affect their, their power structure for the whole month. Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. And so what commercial has been done for a long, long time is they've used ice storage. They make ice at night, and then during the day, during the peak demand hours, they'll melt the ice to keep the buildings cold rather than run the compressors. 
Got it. So you're saying because they're storing this ice during off-peak hours yes. when they're not paying as much for electricity, they can actually use that ice storage to then recool the building during the next day when they don't have to run the chillers or the compressors. That's correct. Uh, these same time of use charges, these peak charges are coming to residential applications. Got it. And the real cool benefit of this is that because you're being able to store energy, you yes. actually can offset how much, how many more power plants go up and the peak charge on the grid. Yes, you can avoid building any new power plants. You go to distribute what's called distributed energy, yep. okay? And you, you put photovoltaic out or fuel cells all over, okay? Mm -hmm. And you avoid any new power plants. You work with what you've got because what we've got is plenty to yeah. go forward if it's used wisely. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you, Ralph, for the tour. I love to see Ross. you. Thank you so awesome. much. Thank you. Right. Wow, the future is bright, huh? <laughs> 6,800 square feet, a pool, a farm. That is seriously over the top. There's a lot going on there. That's true. But you think about the traditional house in America that has cooling, right? Yeah. You have an outdoor unit, a condenser, and you have an indoor unit, right? And you have a set of refrigeration lines between the two, mm -hmm. right? That's cooling the house. You're actually moving heat from inside to outside, rejecting it to the air. Okay. The difference here is that we're using a chiller. Yeah, so what, what exactly is the difference between a chiller and an air conditioner? Yeah, so the chiller is gonna heat and cool water, right? Or glycol. So instead of refrigeration lines moving between the house yeah. and the outside unit, we have water lines. And so I can create a hot tank, I can create a cold tank, so that I can do simultaneous heating and cooling, I can store it, mm. you know, for later use. And, and you get the storage because of the liquid. In other words, he had a tank that was ice. You can only have that with a liquid. That's how he's storing cold. That's right. And he's got another tank where he heats the water. That's right. storing the heat. The key point is the water. I yeah. can store that energy and I can use it at later points in time. Right. right. Okay. And water is the ultimate transfer medium. Nothing's, nothing's better. You know, this, this thing ties into the dream that I've had for a long time in this country. The big house and the yeah. pool? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, actually a scalable and really usable BTU battery. You know, not everybody's going to have that kind of land where you can bury tanks outside. Right. So I, the idea is to have a super insulated tank that would have handles on it. You could get it in through a building, through a doorway. It would have a heat exchanger coil inside it. Yeah. And it would be modular. You could tie them together, tie them together like you would batteries. And then all of a sudden, the, when you're making heat, you can just store it. And then all of a sudden, once you've stored energy in this tank, or these series of tanks, you can come out of it and go out to make hot water for right. your faucets, heat the building with a little bit of radiant and stuff like that. And it's really the future. We've got to find a way to keep moving heat, not trying to make heat. Right. Well, I mean, it is cool to see this future, yeah. to think that something like that could be possible. Is that a day. pun? Cool. <laughs> and, <laughs> and scale down, too, to make yeah. it sort of you know, affordable for most Absolutely. people. All right. Well, good story. Thank you for bringing it to us.